sometimes it's good to take a minute and remember with thanks the people who affected us in our craft and maybe uh, got us to where we are in making beautiful objects. I had the privilege of working with a master craftsman, Pugmore, in North Carolina. And together, we were able to make some pieces when I was just trying to figure out what I was doing. And some of those pieces are in a museum. We went and saw the museum today, and I want to take you around for a little tour. Stick around. Yes, sometimes it is good to take stock in the people who have really invested in you and given you hope that you could rise to a higher level in any kind of endeavor. For me, it was trying to figure out my way in making fine furniture. And I had the great fortune of working and apprenticing with P.A. Pugmore in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. This all started in 1990 when Pug was 73 years old and we together made some pieces for a historic landmark in North Carolina. And we are on our road trip right now in North Carolina. And just earlier today, we got to tour Historic Hope Plantation, which is in Windsor, North Carolina, about an hour east of Raleigh. So it's actually open for tours. They've got a beautiful home there. It's actually the home of Governor Stone. It was in 1800 and he was on the legislator, legislature and at the time of ratification of the, the Constitution in 1789. He was part of the North Carolina legislature who voted yes to ratify the Constitution and he was on the Senate and the House. So he was a, a pretty big guy in around North Carolina, but he built, built a beautiful place there and it's full of great antiques and tells the history, good and bad, of those days in Eastern North Carolina. But it's, it's filled with antiques and it's really a good take. You can visit the place. Uh, we're gonna link to the um, website for Historic Hope Plantation and you're gonna see some pieces there. But what I'm really excited to share with you are those pieces that I got to make with my mentor, Pugmore, and are part of that collection. And actually, well, let's get into it and I'll share you more about the story as we go along. And we'll have time, it's only, it's only what, eight minutes long? Yeah, not much. And what we're gonna do is we've compiled a little video and Tom's gonna uh, talk over it to share the stories that these images and um, places re bring to his mind. And right, just I'll, be, I'll just speak live and uh, at the end, we'll have time for a few questions if you have any. So let's check out the visit to historic Hope Plantation. <laughs> So here we are driving up the way as if we were approaching Augusta National for the Masters. <laughs> Sorry, uh, gang. This is the foyer walking into the mansion. You walk forward. It's really a, a tall uh, Georgian house, a two-story with a large basement. This table has some 18th century uh, Chippendale chairs, but one of them is an imposter. It's actually one that I got to make while I was in Pug shop. I took one of the originals and just copied it piece for piece, and there I found it. <laughs> it was only recognizable subtly by the finish. It hadn't, um, it had aged a bit and um, but I remember spraying toner on that to blend it in just right, misting like lacquer toners to get it to blend in just right with the others. The upholstered seat was a dead giveaway. And then in the same room, these are some chairs original to Hope, the dining chairs, 
And that's the first chair that I ever got to make. Those aren't the chairs I made. They were made for someone else, but inspired on the Hope chairs. And I dragged Pug out in the yard to sit there and take a picture with me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was 91, 92. And this is the WH cabinet maker. This is a corner cupboard. And for years, he was considered the unknown cabinet maker. But they finally solved the mystery and we'll talk about it later, but that cabinet maker was iconic in that area. And we made some special corner cupboards later. Now we went up the stairs. This is Governor Stone's, this was their bedroom upstairs. And you see this beautiful rice bed, sweet carvings there. And then next door is actually the library. This is walking into his library. He, was, he had one of the largest libraries in North Carolina. He had over 1,400 personal books, many law books, but quite a collection for that day. And these cabinets still operate perfectly, all mortise and tenon, pegged, and that old glass, ripply as you look along. And they were just gigantic because there were so many volumes. The ceilings in this house are 13 and a half feet tall, and those bookcases go all the way up. When they were doing the restoration, they took out some of the books in that area and they found Governor Stone had written on the wall a message of really grief about having lost his wife. This is in the ballroom and these chairs that you see here, these little Duncan Fife chairs, those were the first chairs that I saw Pug Moore make in his shop. He was actually making those a set, I think it was 14 or 16 for, for this ballroom. And there's a famous picture I have of him in this ballroom standing there with, uh, with the chairs. These are, look at that great detail. I love that sculptural look to that. And then the doors into the room, they have that, uh, this faux crotch mahogany. Uh, <laughs> that's not old. They were just being done while I was there. But you, when you go, you can enter through, a, you enter through a heritage center where they have all these Indian artifacts. And then this burnt out like Doug Cypress canoe. And then they even have a tub that's made of marble that they say George Washington took a bath in. <laughs> what else did George Washington do? And there's, then there's a side room off the Heritage Center where there is the library of archives that they have. And these bookcases, yours truly got to build after I had left Pug Shop and built these in the same style as Governor Stone's, except instead of having glass doors, they had woven wire, like this bronze wire mesh. But the doors are all mortise and tenon, pegged, and they catch with these bullet catches that we just used on the workbench, dogs. And you can see there's a couple <laughs> down there. There mm -hmm. are 15 cabinets, four doors each. So 60 bullet catches with inlaid brass escutcheons for the locks and air can circulate all around and then right across the way from from that is the uh what do they call this the meeting room? oh gosh i don't remember the name of it but pug and i made this corner cupboard there's two of them and there i am today what is that 25 years later or more oh more yeah more yeah but here's a little closer look of these cupboards they're walnut and they, I was looking and I'm thinking, how in the world high is that? And of course, I remembered. I had my tape measure, of course. So I got it in position. You always do. <laughs> and I spread, stepped it up there and it was nine feet, eight inches tall. I had forgotten that. So that room, you can see how high those ceilings are. I think they're 12 or 13 feet in there. So there's a pair. And they had that nice OG bracket feet down at the corner. And they emulate that WH guy, right? Exactly, yeah. They were in the WH style, except we inlaid uh, different 
initials at the top for Governor Stone and Historic Hope. Had a it's, nice it's little so slide crazy out there. to see you putting your hands on that very same piece after yeah. so many years. Three Look how decades. nice the patina is. It just shimmered, right, with that golden color. Amazing. And then inside, it had these great little scalloped shelves. All painted nicely. It was great to see. It had aged. It, it had. It looked like it was getting old. It had little cracks here and there, uh, but the um, those doors we put putty in. There's Pug gluing up those actual doors. I took the shot of him in the shop and had to putty those in. And what a what an experience. We closed the door on our historic hope experience. And this is downstairs back in the mansion. This is actually a bench that Pug donated to Historic Hope with a lot of those tools you see on the bench. He told me the story of this bench. He found it in Pennsylvania. Look at that chop. And he loved it so much in a barn. He bought it, flipped it upside down on his station wagon. I think he was on vacation with the family <laughs> and strapped it on there and, <laughs> and drove home to North Carolina. And he kept that in an aside when we called his museum room. But it had such great age, and there's some of his tools that he gave them as well. And they, this is their little uh, cabinet maker shop in the basement. Look how great that is. It had such warmth and marks of, of seasoning and use. And then it has one of those big tail vices that we did not do on my new bench. And this is a stamp that shows where Pug lived. It's 2800 Sunset Ave. And looking across the street, that, that road comes in directly across where the house was. And now it's a Sonic Burger. And back behind the house, actually, as you walk into this, this parking lot, in back was where you would find the shop. So I'm walking back here and I'm eyeballing it. And so right about here was the <laughs> shop. So it was like, I'm standing in the shop, right in the parking lot of Sonic. It was so bizarre to be there. And then this is Pug and I outside the shop yep. some years Where ago. Where the purple doorknob is. Yeah, that's that three he finished up. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that? Crazy fun. <sighs> Yeah, so it was really fun to go down memory lane and see objects that we made together. It's kind of a trip to see things that you made like 25 yes. or 30 years ago and how, how they've seasoned and warmed up and to have that connection to someone really important in your life and, mm -hmm. and, not, and realize how we shape those together. But metaphorically, he really shaped me a, a great deal. Yeah. So if it, it wasn't for him, I would not be doing this right now. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot, I have a lot to be grateful for Pug. And we, we do like to say you guys are, are kind of the beneficiaries of that because the neighborhood is very much tailored after what Tom experienced with Mr. Moore and wants to pass on and have as many people as possible experience virtually the same apprenticeship experience. Uh, right. Our thanks to Barbara Bowen and uh, Turner Sutton, who walked us around today. Yes, thank uh, you, Barbara. there at the plantation. And, and they want to encourage you, if you're in that area, mm -hmm. if you head just a little east of, it's actually like an hour east off of 95, uh, you can put it in your GPS. It'll take you right to, you go through some really interesting farm country where mm -hmm. peanuts and whatnot are grown and you know <laughs> there's people living out there but you'll come upon historical plantation it's a great little side visit and you can see the way life was back then they should have so much more we didn't actually get to talk about and show you we kind of rushed through the heritage center but lots to uh check out there and for that type of period for sure yeah yeah um, there were a couple questions, but I, I was able to answer them. Um, oh, what, like what? Like what the holes were at the bottom of the, of the cabinets. You might want to talk a little bit more about the air holes. There. Oh yeah. They, um, because they were, they were keeping important documents in there. The preservationist 
uh, recommended they have air circulation to go in there. So those little cutout holes in the baseboard had a, a little like bronze screen behind them. And then there was another hole inside the cabinet at the back with another bronze screen. So, and up underneath. So actually air could s circulate or get in there. Um, I don't know if they have any books that are that important right now. Uh, they, they must because they, <laughs> but it seemed to be doing its job quite well. That, that was a bear of a job though. I didn't get into it while I was looking at that, but that was one of those jobs I look back and I remember how, how hard it was because I underbid it, you know, mm. and it was like, oh, mm. I just got to get through <laughs> this. And when you do it, you're like, mm. oh, you, you think of the big number because you say, oh, it'll be X amount per bookcase unit times 15. And you go, yay. But if you're like a little under on that, it's times 15. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're like 15 times under. So that was a learning experience, but um, really good one. Mm. I didn't have to paint them, thankfully. I delivered them and then the painters, they had painted them and I had to go back and put the bronze wire in and the backing on that. Yeah, same question about the cupboard. Uh, Brian was curious about the painting in t inside the, the cupboards. They wanted them painted, right? Yes, they did. I believe we, we made um, yellow pine shelves in there. And we had, uh, we had initially shellacked them. You know what? I should mention that. I have to go back. I don't think we did deliver them painted. I have to go back and look at the photos because... Um, I believe we had shellac them. I, I remember that. And it too. was all golden kind of yellow pine. And you, I didn't note it about while we were looking at them. But if you go back and watch the video, the shelves were always uh, positioned to be right behind the horizontal mullions or muttons. Um, and so you wouldn't see them when the doors were closed. But when you open them, you see, oh, they appear. So everything in the cabinet almost looks like it's floating. But now that you mentioned, I think they did paint that after the fact. It was very common to paint the interior of corner cupboards. Um, but I'm not sure if I have those templates, but who's going to have a 10-foot ceiling who wants a corner cupboard? So what happened was another uh, client was interested in having a WH cabinet for their home. And, uh, but it wouldn't ever fit, so we made a scaled down version that could fit in an eight foot ceiling home. So I do actually still have the templates and patterns to make the WH cupboard. Had this these nice carved leaf format at the top. There's actually a book I, I discovered was, was uh, printed in the mid 2000s called uh, WH Cabinet Maker Solved or something like that. Because for a long time it was mysterious. No one knew who he was. But it was William Sear, I believe, it was the cabinet maker's name. And they finally puzzled together because some of the pieces were signed. And WH was the initials of a client. So everyone thought of WH might be the maker, <laughs> but it was a client of William Sears uh, that had that going for him. So. Um, so I have some more questions before we do that, just for folks that are new here, because we probably have some who haven't watched before because we have been on this road trip and we've been inviting, uh, the folks that we've been visiting. We were with, uh, the Northeastern Woodworkers Association over the weekend at the Woodworker Showcase up in New York. Yeah. Awesome. Really great, great time. Great event great up time. there. Uh, shout out to that. If you haven't been to that, it's, it's a regional event. It draws from all over that yeah. area, Sarasota Springs, New York. Sarasota Springs, and also the Northwest Woodworkers Association. They're, they're based, <laughs> Northeast, sorry. <laughs> they're based in Albany. Yes. So if you're anywhere in the Albany region, yeah. that's an amazing woodworking group to be part of. It's yeah. very There's cheap really to be great. part of these guilds, and it gives you some. There's several some in New York that are really strong. So yeah. don't just Google it if you're needing that. They have a great and, shop uh, there too that they work together in. It's we like just a makerspace. came off a day and an evening with uh, the Washington Woodworkers Guild in Fairfax, Virginia. Yeah, that was uh, a great group. Great group too. again. Just some really neat people. Anyway, all that to say that if you're new here, this is unique. We're on the road. We're not in the shop. 
Um, but we don't like to miss a night with you all. So that's what's going on. So stick around. Yeah. This is our epic adventure. So yes. we like to do little field trips too. So this, Bring them to you. this was an awesome kind of a sentimental journey for me. I doubt I'll ever get back there. That I actually took Pug back there in the two, early 2000s, right around 2000. And um, so that was the last time I actually got to spend with him. We went back and visited and uh, so it was pretty, pretty special. How did Pug it. get into uh, building furniture? Pete's asking. Uh, his father actually started in the antique business. He started as an upholsterer. He just saw like great potential in that. He actually, you know, his father was right in the center of the Great Depression. So uh, Pug was born in 1916. So what was he, 13 when the De Great Depression hit. And then in his formative teen years, they were just struggling for making income. And Pug said his father started repairing baby carriages. They were everywhere, like women would... Stroller things, yeah. Yeah, but they were nicely made. You know, some of them were wooden and everything. And uh, he, but his father, father, from all descriptions, sounded like the most optimistic, positive person you could be mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. So he was like, not going to be swayed. And he just loved doing that. And then it turned into antiques. And then it turned into upholstery. And he just, it really started to take off. He started buying and selling antiques. And um, anyway, Pug would tell me about how he's affected by the depression too. And it, it was just a, a strange time. So mm. they were very self-sufficient. So to make things of your own was a thing. But anyway, they bought and sold antiques and they started, his father was making reproductions at that time. So he'd had it going for 10 years or more. And then Pug got brought in <laughs> and he started to, he fell in love with it when he was probably 19. He wasn't thinking he was going to do it, but he started and he got hooked on making 18th century so furniture. Good at it. Mm. So yeah, so they had a, a shop full of guys and, and a really sad event happened. His father got killed on the way back from a delivery with his brother Ernest who was driving the vehicle. It was horrible. And when Pug was 30 years old, so now Pug was, um, had to rise up and take over the shop as a 30 year old with a lot of older men uh, there were seven of them all together. So he ran the shop and he still made a lot of furniture. And, you know, it was it was a big <laughs> responsibility. This is pre-computers. Everything had to be written and called on the phone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a totally different age. Awful. Yeah. yeah. He, his ability to, to withstand deep, deep pain and suffering was really amazing. Yeah, and he went on to make furniture for another 50 years, not 50 years, um, yeah, actually almost 50 years. And never once did they advertise, and, and they never had lack of work with seven guys in the shop. There were four full-time furniture makers, a finishing man, an upholsterer, and Pug, who also was always making furniture. <laughs> and I should say, maybe you've heard this before, but Tom came along at a time, um, Mr. Moore had his wife... Eva had three daughters, and so there wasn't anybody that was carrying it on in the shop, and Tom kind of became that extension for him. So um, they each served a purpose in their life. So uh, Bruce is asking if you got a Sonic Burger. No. Bruce, I was that <laughs> close, but I was like, ah, I'm not really into a burger. I almost got some. But you know what I did do? You know what's funny? I should just tell you, after they built that, Pug was now in an assisted living, and most people would say, wow, that must have been devastating to see your old home gone. And it probably was sad because it was a house that he built with his father and, and the shop. Mm. And he said when he was over at the assisted living, when he heard the Sonic Burger open, he goes, I'd like to go get a Sonic Burger. <laughs> <laughs> so he went over there and he sat in there and he ate a burger and enjoyed it. <laughs> but uh, I didn't have a Sonic Burger, but I did. I wasn't going to miss out on the... You know what I'm going to say if you know North Carolina. On the North Carolina barbecue, <laughs> I had a combination plate of barbecue and fried chicken and yeah. coleslaw and Brunswick stew. And we would have taken you to our house where we lived for eight years when we were here, but it burned down. 
He wasn't there either. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could show you artifacts. It's yes. not as Nothing's memorable here. as pugs. So, so isn't it weird how, you know, things in our history, nothing lasts forever, but that, that soul connection and those beautiful moments and the love that we share yeah. and we yeah. pour into objects, even the objects don't last, but it's that something else that mm -hmm. does. And, uh, that's what keeps me going. Yes, and uh, Fred's mentioning that Sam Maloof was born the same year as Pug. And yes, when we were there in November and got to meet and speak with Mike Johnson, which is another visit we're uh, hoping to share with you, uh, we discovered that. And also that Mike and Tom are nearly the same age. Well, and one so year we apart. Really He's a year older than have me. walked a very yeah. similar journey with those gentlemen and uh, really cool. John's asking if there was any need um, to um, attach those corner coverage to the wall for them not to fall. Uh, no, John, there really wasn't. Um, the times you get worried about that is when you, you have, you know, tall cabinets that swing out, but it wasn't tipsy but the top is screwed into the base so it couldn't fall forward you know you have the glass and the doors and when those open that's what you worry about now that you mention that i'm trying to recollect did we put anything i don't think we needed to it wasn't it was it was back enough but you're you're, hit, you're hitting me with one that i almost can't answer but <laughs> Yeah. It had a lot of solid wood in the back, too. All the back was solid. So um, it was probably as much mass or more in the back. Yeah. yeah. Lupe is mentioning that the furniture that you guys made is still left. And I, you know, Lupe, I was expecting, I don't know, I, I didn't think that they would all be in such great shape. But even the, everything was still sharp and clean. And Yeah. Nice. Well, that's the nice thing about having it in a museum setting. It's like... Yeah kept for the yeah. ages, you know, sure. sensitive. Um, I looked around on that chair that I copied too, and I didn't see it. We didn't sign it or anything. It was, it was, uh, a true copy. So um, who knows? Somebody might think it's an old one someday. Uh, there's a, somebody on here who would like you to talk about your, your prison teaching in the prison. Maybe we need to do an, uh, episode on that sometime. We did once. We did objects made. Oh, that's uh, true. We talked about that. We'll put a link to that that episode. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can check that out. I had a <laughs> I shared a number of pieces that I made there or were made there. Mm -hmm. That's and, true. And the experience there. Uh, um, Tim's asking, did Pug make full size drawings of projects before building them? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not it re rarely. <laughs> I mean, he knew so much of what he was going to do. He would make drawings on plywood. Sometimes we had all kinds of plywood. So he had all these plywood templates for all the chairs he made, um, beds, headboards. Uh, he would draw out like full-size cabinets on plywood and have it. So not on drawing paper. I don't know that I ever saw drawing paper. It was on whatever was around, you know, but on plywood for a high boy or something like that but he would he would draw on the top of the bench if he had to you know make carrying angles <laughs> and things like that it was very practical and direct not yeah. not he wasn't uh doing classes <laughs> <laughs> the drawings was something you brought into the picture right i had to uh like even now i mean my drawings before doing the classes were Enough for me, but if someone looked at it, they might go, ah, yeah. what else? You and know. Mr. Moore's favorite finish or a particular one that he used? It was uh, shellac by far. Um, he would use shellac, and I remember how excited I was to learn that secret recipe because I, um, I had seen his finish on so many pieces in, in homes, so beautiful and warm. But... Another thing he did, he was using, and it's still around, and a lot of you may know this, is deft lacquer. He would use that over the top of some furniture and burnish it out. And I'm almost sure he used that as the top coat on those Fife chairs that were in the ballroom. Because when I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, that's, that's the look and feel of the deft on there. He, would, he top coated with that, and it gave a, a warm, satiny 
look and everything was always burnished and rubbed out with four ounce steel wool at the end and given a polish like a wax and um, a beeswax and lemon oil uh, polish at the end so that that really gives it this very soft warm gloss um, it's it's not a gloss it's just a very soft gloss I would say like you can see on those pieces they they looked great they had aged really well everything looked a little deeper in color but you oh by the way see. can I just say mm -hmm. I have uh, templates of that Fife chair I, I'm just curious if anybody is interested in making that style chair it's a low back chair um, I, I wouldn't do it right off, but I would like, I have some mahogany and um, some started. And I was thinking that as I clean out the attic, I'm going to plan to, to do a course probably on that chair and change it up a little bit, but not a whole lot. But they're not as practical these days, but they're super comfortable for how, how tall they are. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't think, think I better, sold that well. Better call it a night. All there's right. Some, there's some fun, fun people on here. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm sure. Up. Lots of fun thoughts. I um, wish I could see and hear you. Yeah. Maybe someday you can talk about what you would say to your younger self and what you think Pug would say to his younger self. <laughs> this is getting philosophical. Those are good questions, my friends. Oh, so did you did you want to tell them about the unknown furniture maker? Did you want to close that? You did. You told I us, did. told them about yeah the William C. Sear. William C. Yeah, there actually is a book. That's what struck me about it. I saw that in the uh, their little um, showroom there. They had books there about that had been written about this. So if you looked up, if you wanted to curious, and you looked on Amazon, just look up um, the unknown cabinet maker, the W H cabinet maker and it will probably come up in the title of this book it says wh cabinet maker yeah. solved or revealed or something the like mystery. that yeah the mystery so, of furniture making. and then it's a great book though i really <laughs> gonna i'm gonna pick it up because uh, i didn't at the time there wasn't they weren't technically open so mm -hmm. they opened first tours april 1st so you can check them out then great well, again, uh, we, we hope to be live with you again next week. Yeah, everybody. Well, thanks for being on. If you enjoy this content, remember to like, share, and subscribe. We look forward to being back in the shop. And now even more to get back working on that bench. <laughs> it so, waits for you. Yes. Uh, it's waiting for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Once again, thanks for being part of our yes. little group here. Not live from the shop, but... On behalf of the camera lady and myself, we look forward to seeing you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Gotta be quiet because of the neighbors. Yes. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take care. <laughs>